welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man who really wants to ride a rocket corn. It's Nathan LaHaye. You know, I would think I'd much rather do the carnivore <laughs> if it were me. Got to get those big. I'm a cat person, you know. Got to get it going. I'm excited about this episode, Mark. We, we've we talked about it for a while, and when we committed to it, I it's just... And I, just, I, I can't say enough about this movie. I just love it. From the first time I saw it, it was just like... It hits everything for me. It's funny. It's stupid. It pulls the heartstrings. It's all the moments with Grug and Eep, just the daddy daughter thing. Cause I have a daughter, you have a daughter. It's just those things like, it's just everything about the movie I love. And I remember when we first started talking about it, the only thing that I want that I know exists that they need to have, you know, just released to the masses is backstage footage in the recording studio of Nick Cage going nuts as Grug. I want to, I want to see him in action you know as I, he's doing all this stuff you know what i love so much is i i asked on facebook like hey guys what do you what do you think about this movie what do you think about nick cage voice in a caveman and aaron newworth wrote something great like he aaron newworth said he never phones anything in and so just <laughs> watching him listening to him going oh ah whoa ah, ah, ee, ah hey, hey, like nicholas cage puts the work in in this you know i, I love ryan reynolds but he's very ryan reynolds i think yes. emma stone does a great job absolutely uh, but i think you know I, I, but what what Nick Cage does in this movie, I mean, at the end of this film, Nathan, it's Nicolas Cage and a beautifully fluffy cat trying <laughs> to clear a 30 foot chasm or 50 foot chasm together by oh, hiding yeah. themselves in a skeleton of a creature that was eaten by pitch black birds. They put tar Being on flown it. by said pitch black, yeah, birds. pitch black birds. And it's just it's well, I'm just going cinema doesn't get better. You know, it's, <laughs> You know, a lot of people talk about the French New Wave, Italian neorealism, you know, the the American cinema of the 70s, the indie boom of the 90s, the superhero craze of the, the late 2000s and, and beyond. No one but talks about me, the cruise of the 2010s. Yeah, no one, <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not there. Yeah, it's no it, one watch. No one talks about this scene. Like, it's weird. Is does, does crude have a big footprint? The crude's the crude's made over 500 million gigantic film nominated for an Oscar had a sequel, had a TV show, but did it, did it, I don't really, maybe I just don't run in those circles, but it didn't, it's not talked about as much, which is kind of a bummer because it's, it's just not. a good time. A lot of DreamWorks movies are like that, which is a huge bummer because like you have Shrek, of course, everyone's going to talk about Shrek and you have Trolls, which is big, the big thing. But like, look, there's, there was Megamind, which is one of the best DreamWorks pictures that gets referenced here and there, but like, I'm, I'm, really would love that to have another sequel that would be that would be great if that had one you've got boss baby which was one i never thought that i would want like if i was if i was not a parent and that trailer came on i was like that looks dumb not gonna watch that and it's it's so funny that i find myself watching all these things as a parent that i never would have had an interest in beforehand and they're so good boss baby was so good trolls was the same way i would have never watched trolls i just was like oh that's was never my thing and why would i watch it all three of those movies are great. It's just, but yeah, the Croods doesn't get a, a brought up a whole lot in the conversation, and I wish it did because it's entertaining from start to finish. That and the sequel both. When they did the Croods: A New Age, it's wonderful. The voice ask, uh, the voice cast could not be put together better. Um, I read something that the uh, when they were making the movie, they had Nick Cage in mind straight away for Grug, and they even, when they were animating, they took mannerisms and things from his previous films, from Leaving Las Vegas, and from Family Man, and incorporated those into Grug's just movements and things, and I was just like, once, and, and it's funny, because once I read that, and I didn't do this in hindsight of any sort of preparation for, for the episode, but I actually watched Leaving Las Vegas a couple weeks ago, I was like, oh, I haven't seen that in a while, I put it on, and just, you know, drunken alcoholic uh off the walls nick cage and that i see that in grug absolutely so it <laughs> now makes sense i read it and i was like oh that makes total sense <laughs> and and you know they wanted him to be weatherman cage in this movie the beleaguered uh, weight of the world on his shoulders trying his very hardest type of guy the director said that chris d'amico said that and also you know what's crazy you know that nicholas cage was approached to maybe be the ogre in shrek i saw that too and i was going which i had never heard that i had heard about chris farley I heard about them recording, like Mike Myers starting twice. to record, yeah, with Chris Farley and Eddie Murphy doing all that stuff. And I remember seeing, uh, hearing some of the uh, a, a little blip of uh, I think he was doing the Onion speech or something, and I heard that in Chris Farley's voice. And it's just so funny thinking like what 
kind of movie that would have been if it was if it was Chris Farley instead of Mike Myers. But yeah, I I had never heard about Nick Cage, which again, having that same question, what kind of movie would that have been? I found this if great. you had Nick Cage as Shrek instead, uh, Fiona, you know. <laughs> It would have but, been it, it would have been interesting. It would have been very interesting. So this is what he had to say. I remember years ago there was some discussion about doing Shrek, and I didn't want to look like that. I didn't want to be the ogre. I didn't. Now maybe I should have, but I'm glad that Jeffrey Katzenberg thought of me again for this, and finally we found the right one. It's been many years where the two of us have been trying to find the right match, and I must say I'm happy with the result. I like the quality of the humor in this film, and I think it's humor that parents will be comfortable with their children copying. It's pretty wholesome humor, and so I like that said cage so he's yeah and then like hey do you, do you see yourself on grug and he's like well you know like i have kids and like i want to look after them but he's like i take a lot of chances have you seen my movies he's like i'm definitely not <laughs> definitely not grug yeah but you know this is a movie with the sloth like dun 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 and you know the fluffy cat like there's a scene where the fluffy cat is just chasing after grug in the water and it's just one of the most random funny scenes and it's uh it's just a good time and it's and it's easy to understand why it made so much money now what's crazy is eep according to the directors can run 60 miles an hour okay i mean it makes it you can see it in the movie when she's just you know hauling butt and going across so it's like there's that caveman strength in those thighs you know she's got some thick thighs i believe it and then yeah they said that like they're they're just super they said they're one step away she's they're one notch below superhero so you know, when you think about this movie, th- this is an interesting thing. And I want to talk to you about this, Nathan. So I guess the core concept of this movie is Grug. They live, they live in the, in the caveman times. They, they came up with a new era just to kind of broach. Like they're not, it's not pretty, they call it the cordacious period. <laughs> That's what the directors want to be a time between <laughs> okay. times. There you go. So it's about this guy, Nick, C- we're going to call him Nick Cage, right? So it's about Nick Cage. He wants to keep his family safe. And that's Emma Stone. That's Catherine Keener, Clark Duke, and Cloris Leachman. And a baby. Uh, just as And Sandy, just like a dog child, which is very Absolutely. interesting. But everyone else is dead. All the other cave families are dead. So comic We're led to believe that. Smashed yeah, they, by I a mammoth. They, oh, do you yeah, think, think he's lying? Have, it could be. Because we, I mean, we never see him, which is something. But I wouldn't put it beyond Grug to just say, to, to re- uh, you know, invigorate that fear about we have to be in the cave. That you know, what ha- do you remember what happened to the Flintstones? Remember the Flintstones? They're not here anymore. So when you, was the last time you, you saw think Wilma? he's that manipulative? I don't think it's necessarily manipulative. I think it's like anything with parents, you know, bending the truth or setting those you know little lies in for the for the greater good, the greater good. You know, I mean, in anything that's going through, it's like uh, a, a little a little bit of fear is healthy. You know, because way she's you, talking you don't want about it, bad things happening to your family. Or she knew those. She knew those families, though, because she talks about like, I love that we're having this discussion. I never thought we'd have this discussion. This makes me very happy. <laughs> but like, it seems like she knows them and they're all dead. And this time is horrible, but it's kind of interesting. So Grug actually got all of them raised. They're all healthy. They're all old, older. They're all in great cardio shape, they can Fed run 60 every miles an hour. Week, at least. Grug can kick a rock one mile, like a boulder, one mile. And so a they... log even further. <laughs> yeah. And so he he's done a good job. Everyone else is dead. He's done a good job. So it's, it's kind of interesting how they're like, Dad, we need to leave the cave. And I get it. He's very careful. But also, they're living in a horrifying time where oh, yeah. they're food all the time. So it's kind of... They can't be the at owl night. jaguar. Oh, and the pitch black monsters it. like they're just oh, dead. Yeah. And he's Absolutely. kept them alive. So in th- this whole movie, when they're like, oh, dad, you just we weren't living. I, I it was I think, you know, the directors always wanted this movie to be about change. Like this idea originally came from John Cleese. And then the, I they, thought that was so bonkers. Yeah, when isn't I that saw crazy? That. Yeah. Like because it because it was an, uh, originally supposed to be just like a buddy comedy between Grug and Guy. It was just going to be the the dumb Neanderthal and then the inventor guy, which imagine John Cleese voicing guy <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> and, and imagine if they still got Nick Cage to do it like that. Like, it's so funny looking at what this movie was originally going to be and then imagining if it still went off that premise and went forward like the, the guy and Grug stuff was funny 
you know, when they had their moments together, when Guy was stuck in the log, mm -hmm. when they were in the tar, like all this stuff. It, it was really, really good, but it was also very well balanced among all the other characters. If it was just Guy and just Grug, I feel like they would it would have gotten stale yeah you know like I, it would have been funny they would have got some stuff but it was just the two guys together it, adding in those other characters and having that dynamic especially adding in you know the daughter with eep and the you know overprotective father and everything else and it's this new guy that you know is undermining him all these things and f filling their head with nonsense <laughs> like it just adds so much more to it that i think really uh adds to what the original concept was and really made it made it better yeah, I mean, this is supposed to be an Aardman movie, but then they ended the Aardman deal. And then so then that John Cleese idea went away and they just kept running it in their heads. And then Aardman end up ended up making that soccer movie with the cavemen. First, well, I forget what the name of it is, but they made they stuck with the idea and then they adapted Crudes into something that was more you know, emotional. It was like more about like the fear of change. And I get it, but it's kind of tough when you're a caveman and everything wants to murder you. Like I get, you know, in the eighties or seventies, like you have a daughter and you're trying to keep her safe and you're like, oh, the world's a horrible place. But like there, she's not going to be eaten by a were cat and or is that, or like, or swallowed or whole is by she. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> listen, there are things you have to be careful of and you have to be protective, but I just felt bad for Grug because yes, he's overprotective, but the world sucks and they would have died <laughs> had it not been for him. So well, there, there is that big thing that he came with too. It's like, it, it and and, and that, again that hits his parents and everything else is she was like you know if we would have done it your way if we would have stayed in the cave we would have died like if we would have done it your way that would have been the end of us and it's that thing it, it's such a good blend between the humor for kids and the humor for parents but also just those big hitting moments because as fathers we want to do everything we can to protect our kids for zoe and ollie for mallory and and you know going on to elise and meg like we just want to wrap our arms around and protect them from all the ugliness and all the dangers of the world. But in doing that, we could still somehow from no fault of our own unconsciously harm them by trying to keep them that close. And it's, and it, it hit, it's such a good moment because it just hit Grug so hard and almost made the other family members kind of side with her in that, in that moment, you know, I get it, but they all would have been dead long before then had it not been for him. So you can't pat yourself on the back for keeping your children alive. Yeah. But it's, I, don't, I just felt bad. It, it, I think this movie took an idea and it kind of stretched it. But if you think about it too hard, you're, I don't, but maybe that's good. Maybe when you're watching this and when you think about it, you're like, wait a second. Like, Rug, yes, he was overprotective. And because of his being overprotective, his daughter, who hadn't had to kind of survive as much as him or have that weight of the world on her shoulders, wants to experience the world because she's never realized what's on Grug's shoulders over the last few decades. I get it. And it's funny. It's the, it's the wisdom that comes with age, too, because, you know, you know, eat. Yes, she knows the cave and everything else and all the things that she wants to see and wants to happen and go outside of her world. Greg's Grug I said Greg Grug has seen <laughs> that world. Yeah. Uh, Grug has seen that world. He's seen all the horrible stuff like who know who knows what, you know, he went through in his childhood and the things that could have happened to his family. It's fun. Um, here's here's an interesting. Um, oh, wait, no, it says that already. So Cloris Leachman plays uh, uh, plays the grand as a grandmother and that is Uga's mom there are uh, not many cave people that live to that age <laughs> yeah so he's so, probably just dragged her around for many years exactly so and so as much as like grug has been like oh the outside world so imagine what she has seen yeah and the things and she just kind of goes it's interesting that she just goes along with everything well her love like, like, was I'm... squashed by a rock and she was traded to marry somebody <laughs> <laughs> but the whole but it, it's an it, interesting thing that i just said like oh you know wisdom comes with age it's funny that she doesn't have as much of she just kind of goes along for the ride she doesn't have as much of an opinion she leaves the responsibility to grug but later on she does speak up and is like you know we should follow guy we should do this so i don't, I don't know what do you think if she would do you think she was just happy to have a a cave and she didn't have to chase after food as much with grug so she just went along with it until something better came along well, do you think well, she was just riding it out because she had survived every everyone else in her that she knew and she won quote unquote the, the caveman games i think it just gets to a point where grug wants to be in a cave as the world as his world is like the world is fall his world is crumbling beneath his feet it's a it's a pretty it's like literal and metaphorical. literal yeah exactly and so so yes 
what should we do? We should go to high ground. Oh, that's far away. Good idea. So I think the more they fight and the more they struggle, you know, sometimes when, when like the mom or the mother-in-law just kind of, they got, they got their, their son-in-law, their husband's back for as long as possible. But then it gets to the point where like, Oh, Oh, Greg, I'm gonna call him Greg, Greg, (laughs) get over yourself. We're going to high ground. Like listen to Obi-Wan Kenobi. So it's, they, they, they go to the high ground and, and you know what they, they have to figure it out, but they do live. Like they listen to, to Ryan Reynolds plan. I know, I know he, he has a character's name, guy, free guy, but he's very Ryan Reynolds in this movie. But I think at that point, she's like, come on, man. <laughs> like, I'll let you stuff us in a, in a poll for three, three days because the world's horrifying, but this is all about protecting our thing. Like, I think, I think she knows he can keep her safe, but when he gets really awkward about his daughter and him and, and losing the power, then she kind of has to step in and be like, yo, dude, <laughs> get over yourself. Check, like, check him a little bit. Yeah. Like, come on, man. Yeah. We got, we got to get to high ground. And, yeah. and I, I think once he hears that, he's like, all right. But I mean, listen, he's a caveman. He's, he's not that smart. <laughs> He doesn't have any ideas. Well, and so, all they know is, yeah, brute strength strength will help you get through. You have to be stronger than whatever is trying to attack you in order to survive and overpower or you know, throw the bigger rock or whatever the case may be. So it, it makes sense, absolutely. And he even says later on, like, I, you know, my strength is what I rely on. That's what I have. That's and at the end, he's like, That's what I can do to save you guys, is is use my strength. That's what I can do. He can kick a rock a mile. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He, there's a boulder. His toes don't shatter, Nathan. If you and I kick that boulder, our toes would turn into jelly. Absolutely. He kicks that thing a mile. Couldn't well, he pick he, up a rock and just knock something out with it? Yeah, but that would be boring. Like, you, you know, Grug has has taken up and found all these tricks over his years to try to one-up other cavemen. How do you think he won Ugga? Maybe there was a rock-kicking contest, and he, and he came out victorious. So instead of Braveheart, when they're throwing rocks at each other? Just kick him. They're kicking rocks from a exactly. mile away. And he smushes his his her fiance with it. Exactly. Imagine if you had that power, Nathan. You're a caveman. And you know you could kick a rock a couple miles and no one would know. And you could possibly smush your love inter- your rival for your love interest. Would uh, you smush that person? Uh if I was a caveman and uh there was a love interest and I was <laughs> able to do that, I mean, yeah, there's no there's no saying, well, maybe was he a good person? Like, no, I, that's mine. I want it. I won't injure myself. <laughs> There, uh, yeah, caveman, caveman intuition will just say yes immediately. Yeah, no, uh, we're, not, we're not doing this in real life. I'm just saying. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because two miles down, they're like, "Where'd that come from?" <laughs> like, yeah, where was where were you, Grug? Oh, I was I was hanging out by the river. Yeah, I don't I, know. I, I got witnesses. Was, yeah, exactly. You could ask. Uh, you could ask uh, Greg. Greg and Grug. <laughs> they were the best two two of best friends. Hey, he's not. He's we, not we, Homelander. We... Remember in uh, the boys when Homelander throws a baseball and Elizabeth Shoe's like, "That's gonna kill somebody in Portland." Like, Grug's not doing that. No, he doesn't give a crap. It's just it's gone. It's out of his eyesight. It's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, Grug's Absolutely. just smushing rivals, not just exactly. Willy Nilly. We, you, we've mentioned this a couple times, and I have a question to you. We've talked about the cavemen that, that you said the directors were near superhero. We know Grug has his strength. Ugga, to an extent, still has her strength. Um, you know, Sandy is a little demon on wheels. She's got super speed, as do, uh, as does Eep. What is Thunk's superpower? Thunk. So, all right. There's a scene where Sandy. I have I have an idea, him. but I want to know what you what you. Think. Sandy's chewing on him, legit yeah. chewing on him, and there's no oh, yeah. blood. Like he is just, he's just a thick skulled, thick skinned lunk. So You're, so Thunk has invulnerability because that's where I was going. Thunk is a big lunk. He's yeah. David from Unbreakable. Exactly. Can't swim. Will probably drown. Um, but if you try to shoot him or or chew on him, you ain't getting nowhere. <laughs> I, I, because I mean, I think Sandy chewed through some crazy stuff with those teeth in that movie, and mm-hmm. in the second one, her hair blasts through a like a, a solid rock or wood, so her hair is hard. So I mean, mm-hmm. the fact that she can't chew through his skin, he's yeah, exactly. Like if you're gonna be dumb, you better be tough. I think Sandy just gets to be the chimera out of the whole family. She gets the strength, she gets the speed, she gets the invulnerability with her hair. Because if you if you're chewing on something vulnerable, your teeth are going away. So yeah. I think she has also got that. She's just the again the uh, the chimera of all the powers combined into it's a one being. Family, powerful, it really powerful is. family. It really is. And I think that as far as uh, gr- uh, the grandma, I think she just communicates with animals because she has the scarf that eventually goes around to the end of it. She gets her her little like lemur scarf, yeah. and in the second movie, she has Wigasis, 
Mm-hmm. And she can command Wigasis, so she's got the she's got some uh, animal telepathy there. You're you're right though. Grandma knows what's up. She's just been around the block. It's you know you know the older we get, I, I think some I think sometimes the older you get, the more stubborn you get. Like I'm gonna tell you what happened, or oh, 100 percent, or you're yeah, just kind of be like, you know what you do in this situation. I've been in this situation 28 times. You don't need to tell me anything. You I know what, how to handle this situation. You know what I should. You know what I would do. Like we go into a like we go into a, a liquor store. We've never owned a liquor store in our lives. But like, you know what you should do? <laughs> just telling people. <laughs> uh, but then, or I don't know about that. But like that SNL skit. So like, I don't know about that. Hey, you uh, you see the news today about climate change? I don't know about that. But there's, you, you can either have that or you can just be along for the ride. I'm not going to name names, but I, I know some who have dug their head in the ground. And become very stubborn and others who are like where do you want to go eat doesn't matter let's just go like it's chill mm-hmm. like yep. what, do you, what do you want for breakfast it's cool like just i'm chill just give, just give me something to eat like, yeah and so is. she's she's grand like i the grand it edible sense. get it into my mouth and into my stomach and it won't kill me but, fine. but i mean like the common cold is killing people out there you know like he's he's i i respect rug but i do think he becomes everyone's the worst dad possible when oh yeah when guy steps into the picture i'm not saying grug is the hero here grug learns and he becomes better which is amazing and and so does eep like so does everybody and so does guy yeah I, absolutely i was i was just gonna say that but yeah. when he starts like actively sabotaging their survival and they waste a lot of time like the, you know that scene when they're 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 taking a road trip and they're just yelling at each other for the entire oh, day yeah. they could have ran oh yeah but they were just yelling at each that's a good bit but yeah, Grug's just being a turd. And then it's basically just Grug's stop. He stops becoming a turd. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting because uh, going back to your stubbornness, there are, like, there's one thing about him being in set in his ways and being protective and strength is the only thing going through. But when he sees Guy, even though he doesn't agree with him, with the ideas that he comes up with for the, you know, the fish shoes or the, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it wasn't guy's idea but like the flowers pretending to be flowers so the giant you know things don't don't eat you like he sees these things that he doesn't agree with that he thinks thinking is bad but he sees the products and he sees the benefits and the success of it and he's still fighting against it like that makes you a turd yeah 100 yeah. percent. like big old big old neanderthal turd because it gets over being overprotective like hey i don't want my child to die of a mammoth smush or a mm. common cold but then it gets to the point where, no, I am not going to wear shoes or I'm not going to do this. Like, come on. Yeah. Grug. But you know what? That's what the story has to be. If Grug was adaptable, you know, if Guy, like, I love that Guy has to have a tragic backstory. You know, it's, it's just the, the tar, the tar pits. And then he gets stuck in tar. <laughs> yeah. But it, I like how they get out of there, by the way. Like Nick Cage acting as a paper mache. Give cat. me those acting sticks. <laughs> And it's funny, the thing that they've been running from the whole movie that they that was going to kill them, that was their biggest threat, ends up being their savior. Not only for that, but near the end of the movie, too, when the McCarnivore and Grug are in the cave, and, you know, they almost have to rely on each other to get this flying apparatus together to, you know, make it across the crevice. It's, it's uh, an interesting little twist at the end of it that what would kill you is now, you know, your, your savior almost. I want to cuddle with that cat so much. Oh God, that cat! Dude, when it's in a know. cave, smashing them and purring, I'm like, that's that's a fine way to go. Oh yeah, I would I would die happy if there was a, a an 800 pound cat. Not even that. If I was if the end of the world was happening and I found myself in a cavern, a dark, a very poorly lit cavern, and there were nothing but like tigers and lions and just these like giant beasts. And they were scared and we were all cuddled together and the cave collapsed and we all died. I would die happy. Like that would be so great. And I don't know if I ever, uh, if I ever told you this, um, the first San Diego comic before the movie came out, the first San Diego comic con I ever went to, was like, I think 2011, 2012. Um, I went with Greg Horn. Uh, he invited me and it was like the best moment ever. Uh, but uh, I actually got to meet Chris Sanders at that show and he was handing out promotional posters for the crews. Hey. Like I knew that he was like, oh yeah, I did Lilo and Stitch. He was like, that movie's great. He's like, yeah, we got this going. And he signed it and I still have it. And it was Eep on the McCarnivore and a bunch of like little sketches and things from like like concept art and things like that. And it's the best thing ever. And as soon as I saw that giant cat, I fell in love. 
And so, uh, and he even told us, he's like, yeah, the voice cast, it's like Ryan Reynolds and Emma Stone and Nick Cage was like, this movie's going to be great. I can't wait for it. And then of course it comes out and it, and it's wonderful, but I still have that poster around. I need to put it up, but I, uh, it, it's funny. I almost had like a little inside information before it came out, but yeah, the McCarnivore was one of my favorite things about the movie. And it's funny too, when you're talking about either the crudes or any other DreamWorks or, or whatever, like the merchandise that comes out for movies. I don't remember ever seeing any crudes merchandise or even now like shirts or anything that ever came out. If I ever find them a carnivore plushie that's gigantic, I'm buying it immediately. Not for my kids either. It's going to be for me. I'm going to like put it in my bed, cuddle up to it every night. And just like, if it had like, I'll go to build a bear and get a little like thing to go in it. So it's like a purr, maybe a little vibration. Like, how great is that? That'd be wonderful. I want a grug caveman now. You want a grug? But, you know, I think. <laughs> Get five different uh, uh, emotes from his uh, <laughs> from oh, his voice that. acting in there like, when he's I... freaking out trying to scare the punch monkeys. Uh, man, they come back in the sequel, too. They're just a bunch of punch happy punks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They have their own language with violence. <laughs> they make concussions. It's terrifying. No. And, and Guy knows the language. How did Guy. Yeah, I know we're going into the second movie now, but how did Guy. Did he have like a, a like study abroad program where he just lived just with the better monkeys man. for a year and, and, a better and man. got to beat the ever living crap out of them to learn <laughs> to learn their language? It's the third time I'm saying it, but he he's he's a better man. <laughs> I love that their name of that family is a better man. The Bettermans. The Bettermans. It's so good. No, are I mean, we going to talk listen, about the did, second movie or do we need to say to the I first? Because this I, is we'll save it. We we'll can do a it. sequel. We now, can do a secondary. The yeah. thing I think about with with DreamWorks, and I don't want to get into like a Pixar versus DreamWorks argument, but DreamWorks has been very sm smart with with their toy lines. Now everyone talks about just you know what, you know what I love is like Toy Story one through four. Their movies called Toy Story that have sold billions of dollars in toys, and then people are like, oh, like. It's art, but then people go cars. Cars is just all about the marketing and toys. I'm like, guys, you love Toy Story. Like it's um, it's it, I don't know, I, I feel that's I don't you have like, 19 Duke Kabooms. Yeah, what are you I talking about? <laughs> yeah, I don't feel bad. I, I, honestly, like when people start complaining about the cars being kids movies, it's like we yeah, because they are kids movies, and I guarantee you that Cars funded some of your favorite Pixar movies just yeah. by merchandise. But I do think they've been very smart in regards to to you drop a good dinosaur didn't hit but that could have had a good toy line but you have toy story oh, yeah. and you have cars that makes them so much money that they can make um a ratatouille they can make mm -hmm. movies like that but then you have dreamworks animation and listen i have a ton of how to train your dragon pops i think those three movies oh, God, are gorgeous. It's so good you know, uh, roger deakins was the visual consultant on those movies and I was watching the second one the other day. Those movies are hard. They hurt. Like they, yeah, they, some of them, you know, like the second one is not a comfy watch, right? It's not, it's not a watch that you just sit down and feel good about. And they're beautiful movies and they're gorgeous and they should have won yeah. Oscars. Yeah. One of the alphas gets taken out. Oh, Toothless gets like recruited by the enemy. Freaking Jaman Hansu with the missing arm. He's terrifying. Terrifying. And, and yeah. you, know what's, you know, what's crazy though, is that, if you think about DreamWorks, right, the Shrek movie, Shrek 2, you know, I'm 41. So I remember when Shrek 2 came out and was a legitimate event. It came out on May 19th and it made 935 million. And this is before we had Iron Man tearing it up. This is before yeah. we had Inside Out pulling a billion. People yeah. forget just how big it was. But the thing is, like, Shrek merch wasn't huge. Like people weren't buying Shrek dolls. Mm -hmm. Madagascar came out, big hit. Madagascar 3 is like a, beautiful insane thing where they just Dude, drop i some can't acid. tell you how many times i've watched those movies zoe and ollie went through like four months of just like switching them in and out like every movie night which meant okay they'd be like what do you want to watch like madagascar i was like okay which one and it would go like three one two three it's just like so many times i've watched those movies and again ones that i would have never like i don't care about ben stiller being a lion like i don't want to but now that i'm a dad like they're good yeah three is wonderful and, and i listen, love it Kung Fu Panda 2 is gorgeous to look at. Oh Kung Fu Panda, like they're all gorgeous. Yeah. How to Train Your Dragon. But I think what's interesting with them is that they're very heavy. And I think that has hurt the merch lines because even though there's tons of dragons, which are incredible, I don't mm -hmm. see too many selling, right? Like the, but then you look at, at Pixar and toys and, or like Toy Story, right? 
they're toys, but when you're mm-hmm. not looking, they're alive. That's so devious, but they made a good movie. And then you look at cars, you know, make cars merge. So it's, I think one thing that hurt DreamWorks were they had gigantic budgets for their movies. I mean, their budgets really started to balloon. Like How to Train Your Dragon is gorgeous, but 165 million. Monsters vs. Aliens, 175. Penguins of Madagascar, 132. Rise of the Guardians, 145. B movie costs 150 million. Mr. Peabody and Sherman, 145 million. So wait, yeah, they got too expensive. They had to kind of scale back and rethink. And then they put out Ruby Gilman, Teenage, Teenage Kraken, which only had a $70 million budget. But I think they, but what's a bummer is like the Kung Fu Panda movies and the How to Train Your Dragon movies. They're gorgeous. They are. Oh, yeah. Gorgeous. Even even Rise of the Guardians, you mentioned it. And I know that was one of DreamWorks' bigger flops. They lost like what, like $80 million yeah, or, or something good. on that. I love that movie. Like, yeah, talking about like gorgeous stuff and things that hit hard. Like Pitch Black takes out Sandman and like, you know, the tooth fairy is dying. I was like, this is like intense stuff for kids. But it's so or even just Jack's backstory in how he became like it's so good. But yeah, it's it's hard to sell a (laughs) sell a pitch black action figure. (laughs) And you know what's you know what's interesting too, like you know. Puss in Boots 2, The Last Witch, The Wish. Puss in Boots is worried about his mortality, like his, yeah. his life. Like it's, he's going to die. running from death the whole movie. Yeah. And it's a, that's a heavy concept. But mm-hmm. what's interesting is these movies are geared towards kids, but they also tackle some pretty weighty. It's DreamWorks has such an up and down thing because Shrek is like donkey, poop, snot, boogers, butts. Lord Farquaad making some And then ultimately jokes. comes around to being who you are, yeah. loving the person yeah. inside, and um, but which is great. Yeah, not to, well, like, of course, you and I aren't knocking the the uh, moral of the story, but yeah, it's it's much more flighty and nonsensical with the farts and the burps and boogers and, and things like that, as opposed to, yeah, your, uh, your Rise of the Guardians or, <laughs> yeah. or you're running from the, the wolf that's actually death the whole time. It's crazy. And like Kung Fu Panda, there's some weighty issues on there. Gary Oldman's villain was quite scary in that movie. So it's, it's interesting. They walk a, a PG line. They aren't, these aren't cars. Like I know Toy Story movies get heavy. Toy Story 3, mm-hmm. geez Louise. Yeah. But I think, <laughs> I think Pixar can do a good job of just not like, tur- you know, I love Turning Red. I love Luca. I, I think Inside Out is good about dealing with your emotions, but those are more seemingly kid friendly but i think they're just just, they're meant for different age groups and i think that's why there's never been a dreamworks animation film that cracked a billion because because for some reason it didn't because it's not so much ha ha which i mean and and going back to i know we're kind of jumping all over dreamworks now but like going back to the crudes there is so much ha ha Uh it's like holy crap it's and like going into the second movie the peanut toe and you know, the friggin uh, uh, the giant hand from the bee sting. Like there's so much funny stuff and just clever stuff in it. Yeah, it, it definitely it, it definitely takes a turn. Even like uh, uh, Megamind is, pro- is, I would say, is one of the most ha ha out of the DreamWorks, but it has some really deep stuff like the villain that becomes the hero, the hero that walks away because he's not fulfilled. The you know, the guy that is a borderline obsessive stalker that now has these powers and does whatever he wants. Like, this is, you know, kids don't grasp these things as much. It's almost like kids are just sitting there, like, you know, clapping their hands, haha, and the parents are kind of gripping the the uh, armrests of the theater, being like, this is heavy stuff. I wonder if you're going to be able to hear all this. <laughs> How to train your dragon man for like a six year old? Holy mackerel, bro. That's. Yeah. Like that's a herder right there. That's you know, that's the good stuff though. I look forward because Zoe's oh God, Zoe's turning 10 next month. It's bonkers. But as she gets older, revisiting these movies is gonna be interesting because I, I equate it to so anytime that in, in your life you have different moments that progress on, whether you're you know, you get engaged, you get married, you have kids, whatever it is, there are certain things that you go back to earlier in life and you revisit they just hit different uh, the thing that i always tell people is my favorite comic book series saga by brian k vaughn it's a it's like a giant space opera you know two warring alien races blah 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 two of them get together it's almost like a romeo and juliet type of thing but it's very 
heavily based in like family and they have a kid that they shouldn't that should have never happened and i remember reading it before i had kids and just loving it it was so funny and all this stuff i reread it now and there are about five or six moments that make me choke up because i'm now a dad it's just and i think that that the dreamworks movies skate that line a lot closer than pixar and i look forward to when my kids get older i'm like hey remember that movie let's go watch it again and having them be like dad oh my god <laughs> yeah you showed me this when i was seven or like you you didn't know the world then kiddo sorry yeah and, <laughs> but that's the mark of a good movie i i think when there's yeah. a movie when you can watch it as a kid and just lo- love the the whiz bang of it all and then there's a movie you watch when you're five years older and you can appreciate more of the the relationships between the kids or the relationship between hiccup and oh crap what's her name she's great america ferrara oh, um 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 oh my gosh i can see her but she's character great. in my head yeah you know, their relationship and then when you get older and when gerard butler gets wiped out when he gets with his mom like when he finds his mom you're just like holy mackerel mm-hmm. there's i think that's the best entertainment and this is really weird but that's why i love starship troopers because when i watched it when i was a teenager Whoa, big big shift yeah but, big like, shift. but, but i'm just saying <laughs> When I watched that movie as a kid, I was like, action, death, yes, kill the bug, yes, get him, throw the thing and, in the back of it, blow it up. Yeah. And then I got older, older and I was like, oh, this is a take on fascism. And all these people were cast because they have TV good looks. And the way the dialogue is, is on purpose. So not only is this a good lizard brain movie, but this is a good take on like fascism. And it's actually a really, su- like not subtle, but it's just a very smart take. So it's a movie that evolved with me as I got older. Yeah. It's like Ferris Bueller. I used to love Ferris Bueller when I was older. Now I just think he's a little sh- punk. Sorry, <laughs> we got to keep this good. I think he's you a little punk. You it. <laughs> and and no, those so are, those are some of the no. And and again, being a being a dad now, and the things that you're almost subjective, they're subjected to watch. Like all my daughter parents. just watched Minions, and it oh. makes me very happy. Oh, Minions was fantastic. That was a, a so many rewatch. But things like I'm gonna say a couple of things here, and parents listening will probably cringe when I say it. Like Coco Melon. Uh, Coco Melon, or there was Blippy wasn't bad. Blippy was okay, but there were just those certain kids shows that are just like mind numbing, just for kids. It's repetitious. We're gonna get like Teletubbies, all this stuff. But the things that are more smart and more entertaining, not only for like us parents, but even for the kids too, is like Sesame Street doing like the the cookie theater where they did like the Cookie Monster version of Game of Thrones, or like anything that like makes it so goofy and up in the air and ha 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 that kids are going to just laugh and clap and be like, Oh, that was so silly. And then have parents in the back, like, like holding their lips closed because they get a joke that is just for the parents or, or something that's just, you know, so over the kids' heads. Those are the most entertaining things because it spans that audience, right? It has that big, big gap that everyone's going to be entertained, whether you're eight or 80 for, for whatever reason. And as you go back to watch it, for reviewing purposes you're going to find things later on you're like holy crap i've I've watched that a million times and i was seven years old how did i not get this 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 and this no you're absolutely right and i think that's why growing up i i loved movies that that you know stand by me (laughs) or i don't know (laughs) movies where kids go on an adventure and learn some stuff there i feel like when there's a little bit of danger and i think the crudes has that i think i think how to train your dragon has i think kung fu panda they have that so it's a, I don't know, there's some really neat learning lessons to get. And not, I'm not saying, I think Pixar has those. I think, you know, I think Illumination is just a lot just to make kids laugh and they're mm-hmm. a lot cheaper and they learn from DreamWorks. But yeah, I, I think what's interesting too about DreamWorks is when you watch a Illumination movie, when you watch a, you know, Studio Ghibli movie, when you watch a G kid, oh, who's the, um, who, there's an Irish studio. When you watch one of their 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 films, I forget the name of their studio. You you know who it is. But with mm-hmm. these movies, I wouldn't say Kung Fu Panda looks anything like How to Train Your Dragon looks anything like Shrek looks anything like Mega Mind looks anything like The Crew. Yeah, looks they, like... they can definitely stand on their own. They have their own uniqueness to them that clearly they're all part of the same kind of studio and going through. But they could stand alone, kind of on their own. One thing that that you said that uh, I think we should touch base on, you said like, you know, everyone kind of learns something in this journey. Going back to uh, what do you think out of all the characters in the crew, you have Guy, you have Eep, you have Grug, 
what do you think is the thing that they took away from the journey that was like number one that went through? I think we should go through all of them and be like, what was the thing that they learned or that they got out of their shell or do whatever? Like clearly Thunk doesn't have to be afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is terrifying. And EU. yeah, he has Douglas. Who, he has a best I, I, friend now that I mean, I thought prior Douglas to the died. cave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> prior to the cave, Thunk would have tried to kill Douglas. It's like, dad, that thing's going to eat me. And they probably would have eaten Douglas. Now he's his best friend. You don't have to be afraid of everything. So he has a buddy. I think he's got Eep, a buddy. I think Eep just learned that her dad just was keeping her safe. And yeah. They, and I don't know what else they could have done during this period, though. Like, they needed a cave to go back to. They needed, mm. like, uh, listen, with those pitch black demon birds out there, you need somewhere to be at night. Mm -hmm. So it's, they didn't have fire. So I think they just learned to appreciate. She learned why he did what he did. And then he learned from her. Does that, so he, he learned to embrace change. He learned to accept mm -hmm. other ideas. He learned to, to trust his daughter and to kind of get over himself. She learned to kind of appreciate that she's alive one from her yeah. dad. And then also that he can change as well. I think for guys, sometimes the simplest thing is the best thing. You know, he's always has to have these like big convoluted like going through, but sometimes you just need a little bit of uh, an extra push, a little bit of extra muscle. A guy, guy going needs on that. stuff. Are you saying guy I think needs I, a little push? I think that's what guy learned is like not everything has to be this big convoluted thing. Oh, oh, because like, what are you talking about following the light? Just, just in general, like any, any solution had to be this extravagant thing whereas grug is just like again the, the, all he knows is muscle you got you got to push through you got to do this thing oh that's a good point point. and then they team up and work together well yeah absolutely what do we think uh what do we think uh grandma learned nothing she already knew everything <laughs> yeah she she has been through it all before yeah. it's old hat <laughs> no but you know what i think she learned to speak up with grug because he was always like is she yeah. dead and I think they learned mutual respect between each other. So I think that's yep. good. Yeah, for sure. For uh, sure. In-laws can be tough. And I think that the most underrepresented character here is Ugga. Because she's just, she's like, oh, your dad's doing the best he can. But your daughter's just trying doing to keep the peace yeah. the whole time. Yeah, exactly. And so she, I don't think she learns too much. But now I think her life will be a lot easier. Because <laughs> she doesn't have to deal <laughs> with these two punks fighting with each other all the time. Yeah. Like Grug's, like, Ugg's got a, wait, no, Thunk has a friend. Nick, Grug's kind of gotten over himself he's embraced change well i think if anything for Uga, it was always listen to your dad follow your dad your dad knows best like trying to be the peacekeeper but then allowing these other things in that it doesn't always just have to be listen to your dad it's almost to an extent the same thing as uh as the grandma that she is able to speak up is able to speak her mind is able to you know she's still the peacekeeper but she's opened herself up for other possibilities yeah, and I think she'll just be able to become her own self. Just now that they're out in the world. and Grug I think Ugga has a lot more development in the second movie. Yeah, 1, exactly. Yeah, ex oh, cause, yeah. Because she's out of the cave and her daughter's hanging out. Her daughter's dealing with, with Ryan Reynolds. Her dad's <laughs> out there figuring, like, you know, her husband's out there checking stuff out. Her son's watching TV. So she's, she, she deals with another dream. mom that thinks yeah. she knows better. And Oh, gosh. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, God, man, but, the second movie is just so good, too. We're gonna have to do a second one. Oh, no, absolutely. And because I <laughs> listen, I, I I think I think DreamWorks is pretty cool. Like I I remember watching the, I remember watching the third How to Train Your Dragon, and that one goes heavy as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's I think I think one nice thing about animated films are they can help you deal with loss. If you look at Lion oh, yeah. King or if you look at some of these movies, that just teaches you how to deal with that and process. And I think maybe that's good for kids. Yeah. So it's but yeah, I think this one is is very family friendly. Like you watch a Shrek movie and you're like, woof. You <laughs> like there's some there's some things in there. And I, I I think this one is Daddy, how does a dragon make babies with a donkey? <laughs> <laughs> and what's it's nice, only when you're older. <laughs> what's nice is like the humor in this one. I think sometimes when you're going for body humor, it's too easy. But there's some legit jokes in here. Like you said, when the snake tightens up on him. Uh when <laughs> Be belt version 2.0 itself <laughs> no and yeah this... grug's grug's uh, uh and, and even just like the reason why grug decided to have ideas in the first place is so he could kill his mother-in-law well if he ever had an original idea of his own i would just turn over and die and he has a slow pan to the camera 
And all of a sudden, the next morning, he has all the ideas. He's got the shades. He's got the rugs. It rounds the rug. And he's got the mobile home and all these. Uh, oh, what did he do with the with the boulder that he just like threw backwards and attached himself to? <laughs> wheels, I think. It's a new wheels. Car. Yeah, I think so. Or transportation, yeah. something like that. But yeah, the, the the main reason, like he wanted to, you know, gain the respect of his family back and show people that hey, I can do this too. But the thing that tipped the scales is oh, I could kill my mother in law. Like that's. <laughs> That's an adult joke. <laughs> and when, and when right that, there. <laughs> that voice he puts on with his dreadlocks when he's doing it, I feel like if it's another actor, it's not oh, going to be hey, as... hey, man, I yeah, have these not... ideas. They don't come from my brain. They come from my gut. They come from my stomach. <laughs> he's such an idiot. No, I, there's, I love there's that. such good one-liners in it when a when, uh, guy is trying to do the drawing about where a brain is, and he did Thunk too, and Thunk looks at the drawing, he's like, Dad, I don't have a brain. <laughs> Like there's just so many little tiny things that make it just ridiculous and funny and and wonderful. Like I, it's it's one of those movies that I am so happy to say. Like going back and I made you know cracks at Coco Melon and things like that. And and to an extent Madagascar. But every time my kids are like, "We're gonna movie night. What do you want to watch?" If they're like Crudes, I'm like, "Thank God I don't get tired of this movie." And that I think is one thing that also sets uh some of the DreamWorks movies apart from, from other animated is I don't get tired of them, man. There's something about the movies that they just, they flow really well. The comedy is a good mix between kids and adults and it doesn't get dull. Like toy as great as toy story is. I think I could only watch it so many times. Same. And you know, this is the thing though. How the hundred tree and dragon movies are gorgeous. I own them all. I don't know if I want to watch them much because I was watching the second one the other day and I went, Whoa. And so for me, it's minions, just minions all day. Because minions, yeah. not only have I had, to, I've written five episodes for film theory about it. So I know every single corner of all the minions episodes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I know how to kill them. I know what they are. I, I just yeah. think it's funny the more you watch it. But that's such, minions is such a breezy movie. There's nothing mm-hmm. serious about it. And, you know, like these things are immortal, they can't die. No one yeah. dies. Like, and, and people do die in theirs, but like it's just such a silly movie i think it's that that's what lends itself to being rewatchable but then you have a movie like how to train your dragon 2 or jeez ways or how to train your dragon 3 or how yeah. to train your dragon or even like the first kung fu, kung fu panda they're quite heavy and mm-hmm. so i think that's what makes them hard to watch a lot if that makes like the shrek movies are too abrasive to watch all the time so mm-hmm. how about this let's do let's do a rewatchable animation film draft where we, we each pick five animated films that we could just watch oh all gosh. the time. Oh my God. All right. I'll oh. let you go first. Oof. Um, I mean, this is going to deviate from Pixar and DreamWorks, but it's got to be the number one that I got to say is uh, Spider-Verse. Oh yeah. I could watch that movie any day of the week. And Which one? In, I, Into... I'm going to stick with the first one. I'm going to, yeah. the, the second one is great. I finally watched it with my kids my wife tried to take Zoe in the theaters and she got freaked out when the spot got super like juiced up. It just kind of like threw her a little bit. So they didn't finish it. But we watched it a couple weeks ago and they both loved it. But that first one, like, Oh my God. Gorgeous. So, oh, it's so good. I can't. Yeah. Well, we could have a whole thing about that. So I'm just going to say, yeah. Um, enter the spider verse minions minions. I am going to go with, Oh, what's one that I'll go to how to train a dragon. I'll go number one. Oh, wow. You can do that a lot. Oh, d- dude, the moment where Hiccup finally figures out how to fly with Toothless through all of the... Oh, it's gorgeous. The, it's And just that moment, like, it's 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 exciting, and it is action, like, where they're going through and doing all the stuff, and he just throws the thing aside and figures it out, and he gets through it, and he, like, throws his hands up, and Toothless throws the fire. Like, it's... it's it's It gives me goosebumps, man. It's just that with the music and everything oh, else gorgeous. on it, it's gorgeous. It is a... I think a perfect moment in in animated film. Got it. I love it. I'm gonna take Wally because I I had to, I had to yes. watch Wally. Yes. I had to watch Wally, and then I had to write an episode about whether he's Satan or not. So I don't. I'm analyze. sorry about whether he is Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This it's... is the conversation we're gonna have another time. But yeah. why? I'm just, I'm just gonna ask that. Why would Wally be Satan? <sighs> I, I wrote it two years ago, but it has something okay. to do with Eve and like how he corrupts her. 
Oh, gee, like oh. he gives her life. Okay, like you know how he, Eve gets an apple, and like he, but he gives Eve a plant. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. yeah. so I had to write a That's, whole thing about okay. that. Okay, I'm done with that question. <laughs> um, it, the, I love the things I get tasked with. They're like Mark. Oh no, that's this. fantastic. Um, you know what? I know what I'm going to do next. Nimona. Oh yeah, oh, I got to send you that poster. That is such a good movie, man. Oh, it's so good. So I just spelled out pneumonia and it switches to pneumonia. Pneumonia. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Pneumonia. All right, I'm going to do Fantastic Mr. Fox because I have just watched that an incredible amount of times. And I just find okay. it to be. I already know there. what my next one's going to be. All right. It, it, right. Uh, I should have I said it starting. Uh, Disney's Hercules. Oh, oh dang. Dude, a... my favorite Disney movie. Yeah. James Woods is Hades is Chef's Kiss the music in it is wonderful like they're just so i remember when that when, when did that come out like 93 94 something like that i don't know the the moment it's the first time i remember cry, laughing until i cried it was the moment when hades is freaking out about like all the stuff and like we can't get hercules and he look and he hears the squeaking and he looks down and pain has uh friggin the hercules sandals on and he's just like what are those <laughs> it just killed me every single time so yeah hercules 100 love it you know the emperor's new groove is a solid pull too that one's really watchable mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so you know what i'm gonna go with tangled Ooh, yes i may get flack for it but the far superior film the frozen mm, there oh, you go. Wait, wait you know tangled walked so frozen could slip on it's, the ice but no exactly I'm no, I am not. No, Frozen. It was something everyone was like, "Oh my God, Frozen! You gotta do blah blah blah." And Good like, music. It, took a, it took us so long to watch it because we were in our Tangled phase. We're like, "Oh my God, this movie is so great and it's so fun and do all this stuff and Maximus and then the music is great." And so by the time we got to Frozen, we're like, "Oh, this is gonna be wonderful." And I remember watching it. I was like, oh, "I really just wanted to watch Tangled again." That mom, <laughs> the stepmom in Tangled, is one of the worst villains ever. She is so oh, yeah. emotionally oh, manipulative. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. scary. Oh yeah, it's scary. All right, so what's your, oh, that was a good what's one. your fifth one? Oh, my, my fifth what, what re, Recap to me what I have. I have Spider-Verse. I have Spider -verse, How to Train Your Dragon. How to Train Your Dragon, Nimona, and Hercules. Nimona and Hercules. Ooh, damn, that's a good list. Last one. <laughs> last one. Animated movie. Now I'm going through all the ones in my head that my kids you know, watch. You I love Ghibli. I've watched, I, I own every Ghibli, but they get pretty heavy. Like, I don't know if I could watch. They do. And as much as I love Princess like, Mononoke, Coraline. I was like, I don't know if I would put that on there. My God, I'm uh, oh I don't oh, know. Cartoon Saloon, you, I love their stuff. But if you I, know what yours is for number five, you pick first, because then because I I don't know what it I'm is. I'm still working on it. <laughs> I'm we're, still working. We're at an impasse. Yeah, like what's? Oh my! Like, I'm like I'm like literally going through my head of like things that are on the watch list or like DVDs that we have for the kids. Mm, I don't know if that's the one. I was thinking about saying Ratatouille, but I was like, ah, I don't think that's gonna be the one. Castle in the Sky. Castle in the Sky is really good. Oh you know, my the, gosh. Like, you know what? I love the boy and the heron, but it's so abstract <laughs> that you just kind of, <laughs> you, you're just kind of like, I don't, I, this is gorgeous. I'm going to buy the Blu ray. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the limited edition steel book. It's but, funny. We've, we've talked about like all of the different, like we, we've gone through Pixar, we've gone through DreamWorks, and all the things that like work that doesn't work, going through all this stuff. You know what? I think I know what I'm going to pick because it. I think it's an underrated one. It's one that I really, really like, and I think I've watched it more than my kids. And I'm I'm going to go with Rise of the Guardians because right. just the different takes on Santa, on the Easter Bunny, on the Tooth Fairy, the the things that happen in it, like Sandman being a total badass, like going through, like it's just it's good. It's really, really good. And that was another movie that I was just like, why doesn't this get more attention? Like the story is is good enough to be like silly for for kids. Like you deal with the Easter Bunny and you know, Hugh Jackman, Australian Easter Bunny with the boomerang, and you have <laughs> Alec Baldwin as the Russian Santa with like naughty and nice on his tattooed on his arms. Um it's it's good. It's one of those that I remember. I remember watching. And I was like, that was a really good movie. And I've every time every time I've watched it since, I've enjoyed it just as much. I, yeah. I, if this is a rewatchable, you don't get tired of that movie. That's the one I'm going with. I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go Kubo and the Two Strings. 
that's one that I still need to watch. Oh my gosh. I, I remember love... getting super excited when it was kind of... another one that um, I was and like, oh God, I want to watch this was nine. I still haven't watched nine. Oh, I haven't watched that either. I need to see which that. it's t- I, if I remember correctly, it's Timber uh, Memdotov, which I love because of uh uh oh my gosh. Day oh watch, my gosh. Night watch. Yes, I love those movies so much, and I'm I'm shocked that I haven't watched nine yet. Probably because the kids were young when it came out, and I was like, oh, I can't watch this. It may, may freak them out. But you know what? Coraline I'm an adult. Freaks me out, right? Like, that's... No, oh, wait. Not... Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. Go for it. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. no. That's fine. That's all I had. Uh, and, like, Coraline freaks me out still. Nightmare Before Christmas makes me unsettled beyond all belief. Box Trolls. The beginning of Box Trolls just makes me want to cry every single time I watch it. So those aren't movies I want to watch all the time. So for me, like I just think Kubo's gorgeous, Tangled, hilarious, Fantastic Mr. Fox is great. And I, it's kind of crazy I didn't pick Ghibli. Like if I had to pick my favorite of all time, I'd probably pick like Castle in the Sky. And but I just don't know if I want to watch those all the time. Like I'd rather just yeah, put on Wally. I don't know either. Like and I never be- before uh my my in-laws actually went on a huge Ghibli trek with my kids and they would watch show them Totoro and all the Castle in the Sky and, and all that stuff. And the main ones that I watched when they came out was like Mononoke and the more, you know, adult themes was that I, I never watched Totoro. I was like, I don't care about the big fluffy guy, whatever. And I watch him now. I was like, that movie is amazing. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh yeah. Um, it's gorgeous. But yeah. Again, but it's not something I was like, I don't want to want to watch Totoro. Let's put in Totoro. It, like I'll rewatch things. If my kids want to, but it's not something that I go to right away. And yeah, I don't know why. I recently watched the boy and the beast and like wolf children. And those are gorgeous Japanese animated films, but yeah this is give me minions just i'm i'm prefacing this by saying just just stupid uh gibberish versions of hair that's all i want watch (laughs) just you know the best rewatchable movies are just the ones that you can just flow with if that makes sense like not the ones that just you don't have to think about grinder yeah it's nonsensical you can just watch and laugh and have a good time and you don't have to worry about you know if you're going to get brought down by someone you know the mufasa falling to his death or look around and if your kids are watching it with you are they going to get sad about something it's yeah the hunchback it, in notre dame on notre dame that guy singing hellfire about like that woman he's gonna like damn her to hell that up with her. movie yeah the the things you miss as a kid we could do a whole episode on animated or kids movies that you watched that you didn't understand the bigger implications of or certain jokes but beyond i think uh when we the first episode we did for teenage mutant ninja turtles i missed the gay joke between casey jones and donatello as a kid went right over my head you're a claustrophobic you want a fist in the mouth i never looked at another guy before i was like oh my god (laughs) yeah that's a 89 line huh absolutely But, but listen man this this was fun to tackle and i i I had a good time learning about this movie, researching it, reading about Nick Cage. Just, you know, I, I think, um, I think this is, this was fun. I, and it's just it, funny. It was, it's, it's, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question to you on this one. Cause it could be a very, uh, it can be a varied answer with all the goofiness and certain things that go on in this movie with Nick, Nick Cage acting like a caveman and going nutso on punch monkeys with, uh, you know, guy coming up with all these insane ideas with all the different chimera animals that they made, like the carnivore, the owl, jaguar, like any of these other things. What was your favorite part of the movie, whether it's a creature, whether it was a moment, whether it was an invention from guy, whether it was a, uh, a one-liner from one of the characters what's something that if you had to look through the whole thing you're like that's that's or just the most ingenious thing that they could have done for uh for cavemen (laughs) all right top three uh belt going dun 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 with perfect comic timing yeah the first time belt did it was great you know belt was voiced by chris sanders yeah i love that and he did stitch (laughs) so it's yep yep uh, well, and I think the, the the fluffy cat swimming in the water after Grug and Grug's like, oh crap! <laughs> like that's just so funny. Like it's just such mm-hmm. a funny cheeky moment. And then the third is just watching the cat and Grug and Doug on a in a skeleton carried by murderous red birds <laughs> across the chasm. Yeah, that's I, I was watching. It, I'm like, this is peak cinema. Doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> I think for me it was uh, the shoe moment right away when they're going when they're going through i mean you (laughs) have the 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 fish yeah exactly you have the fish on thunk you have like all these different things like he's afraid of his own shoes and then just the moment with uh with eve where she looks down she's like "Ah, i love them where are my feet 
like that was that was perfect um nick nick cage going full caveman just going <laughs> like that is that is what i want to see i want to see him in the recording studio i want to see all his mannerisms going nuts and all the different takes because it's freaking hilarious and then oh man what would number three be you can come out of the cave but you didn't give the single i'm saying you can come out of the cave well yeah but how do i know <laughs> okay good i can come out of the cave now and and this isn't a a, a clever moment or a funny moment it's just one that hits me every time is when they're all blown on the horns and rug comes across on the sun and goes down he's like ah where's the danger and he just grabs him and says i love you too because you didn't get a chance to say it that stuff that just hits the dad button man Mm -hmm. yeah those are mine which is like mallory i'm just gonna keep you in a cave i'm gonna learn all the wrong (laughs) lessons i'm gonna name everything i'm gonna make it rhyme with my name uh hugs it rhymes with grug uh, when when I hug you, it's gonna be a a, a start a, a blark. So it rhymes with Mark. <laughs> a blark. Park. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, man, this was this was fun. This was a good time. Like I, I'm ve- I was yeah no, I was very I was looking forward very much to talking about this movie because out of all the ones that I've either been forced to watch with my kids or just have come out like this is one that has stuck and has been one of my favorites. So I'm um, I'm glad we got to chat about it in a a family friendly way listeners so that uh, you can talk to your kids about it too if you want um and yeah i it it, for people especially that are just like caveman movies animated things suck um again it's nicholas cage as a caveman what else do you want man just go watch the movie already and like it's very mff i i I recently dropped a movie that came out in 1997 that literally no one can watch so it's called a better place with johnny numb so i'm all about <laughs> posting the weird I, I like when i post an episode it's a balance it's when a balancing I, what, yeah, yeah exactly when i post an episode every when do i post episodes monday i want people to be like what like that's well, exactly like we did you know we did teenage mutant ninja turtles and then we did desert heat it's the, the balancing <laughs> act you know exactly yeah, and then we did absolutely. fallen and then we did legion versus priest I want to do, we do some goofy stuff and I love it. I want to do Hitman versus Hitman, but I'm not going to recruit you for another one of those. So it's, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up the Crude's franchise and then maybe we can, I don't know, we'll move on from there. But dude, this was awesome, man. And, and, and where can people find you before we get out of here? Um, oh God, I'm not very accurate. Uh, my, my Twitter slash X is honorary GL. Um, I just post a lot of my comic book finds. And uh, my miniature painting and just goofy, nerdy things. Um, I'm going to be doing uh, some more tabletop gaming stuff. So I'm sure there'll be uh, little clips of uh, either Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or um, a very interesting game called Raccoon Sky Pirates, which, Mark, if you ever want to do a uh, offshoot of movies, films, and flicks and do a little uh, tabletop gaming storytelling... That would be a really stupid one. Essentially, you're uh, it's a group of raccoons that are in a junkyard. They somehow make a flying apparatus to go into town to find better trash. And you just uh, kind of do storytelling together, and it's bonkers. If you want to have an idea of how bonkers it gets, the la- the game that played last, the raccoons successfully store a- stole a car, but they ripped it out of the garage through the ceiling. And so it was just dragging through town as an anchor <laughs> on their friggin' flying machine. It's dumb, but that's the kind of stuff that uh, that you'll see with me if you decide to follow me on social. I love it. And it's not dumb. It's beautiful. It, it's, it, it can be both. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've made my money on dumb data. so I mean, it's, it's yeah, Tom Cruise running. Say no more, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, hey, thank you for joining me, Nathan. Thank you for inviting me as always, man. Always a pleasure. All right, so for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, for Nathan LaHaye, it's the movie Sons of Flicks. We'll see you next week.